Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we'll do our normal Friday routine where we wrap the week. We focus on how the markets and the picture of the markets has changed from last Friday to this Friday. Certainly, yesterday's weakness overmatched by today's strength with comments from the Fed yesterday weighing a little heavier on the markets. Comments today from Chairman Powell alleviating that negativity, pushing to the upside with small caps, accelerating the market to finish strong. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market activity using the power of stock charts, using analysis of price and trend and sentiment and breadth and momentum and all of those tools we can bring to bear to try to understand investor psychology. At the end of the day, I was told by my mentors early on, if you know nothing about, uh, else about the market environment except the price of the S&P 500, you're still doing pretty well, right? Because the price of the markets, the value of the indexes will tell you the overall trends. It will tell you when to be bullish, when to be bearish. It'll tell you when to press longs or when to get a little more defensive. A lot of times we get caught up in those other narratives and we forget to focus on price. And a day like today is a great reminder that the trend remains positive, even though we've talked about all the potential cautionary signs, signs of uh, exhaustion, overbought conditions, bearish divergences, breadth deteriorations. At the end of the day, the indexes keep going higher. And as long as that continues, that is the trend. That is where you need to be, uh, need to be following things. So we'll dig into some of the charts that tell that story uh, today. Uh, we have some great guests on the show. I'm super thankful this week. I was thinking about my conversation with John Kosar yesterday, talking about his breadth uh, model, his macro model that just turned completely bullish this week uh, as uh, things like advanced decliners turned more positive. Next week, we have David Auerbach on Tuesday, the 31st. Uh, he's editor of the Daily Reap Beat. On Wednesday, September 1st, Bob Lang from Explosive Options. I'm very excited next Thursday, uh, September 2nd, to talk with Denise Chisholm. Denise uh, is one of my former Fidelity colleagues. She's the sector strategist there, uh, really knows her stuff about sector rotation. It'll be a fascinating time to see what she is seeing. Also, just a little bit earlier today, we recorded our latest episode of The Pitch. If you go to stockcharts.com slash The Pitch, you can see more information about that. Uh, special, which is airing at five o'clock Eastern on Stock Charts TV, will be uh, on demand. Some great conversations with Leslie Jufloss from Trading Live Online, Grayson Rose from StockCharts.com, and TG Watkins from Simpler Trading. A lot of fun, and uh, I encourage you to check that out for sure. Let's uh, let us wrap the week. Uh, main goal on Friday: two things. Number one, wrap the week. Look at how the markets have changed. The second piece is going to be opening the final bar mailbag and answering some of your questions. I wanted to start it out uh, with uh, our Wrap the Week segment. We're going to start with today with a poll. We always have a poll running on our live stream page on stockcharts.com. Also on social media, we'll send a poll ar around and encourage you to participate. We asked you just this week, which asset class performs best through the end of this year, December 31st, 2021? I gave you four choices and the far, by far, the uh, the winner with uh, two thirds of the vote stocks in the form of the SPY was 68% of the vote. Gold it got 17% of the vote. The US dollar got 10% and bonds only got 5%. So two things that I would answer. Number one, I'm I'm super encouraged, Final Bar Nation, for answering really in the in the uh in the perspective of the trend. Out of those four, which is having the strongest consistent uptrend, it's undeniably uh stocks which have continued to push higher. You know, well before today, you've seen that persistent uptrend in the SP holding its 50 days. So I like what you're seeing there. Um, gold number two, which, which is interesting, gold has actually rallied pretty good today. And uh, Leslie Jufloss, one of my guests on the pitch earlier, uh, talked about gold, particularly Newmont Mining and the materials sector is, uh, is starting to show some encouraging short-term signs. And I think that's certainly an area to watch. My contrarian hat is buzzing, or my, 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 my ears are buzzing thinking of bonds uh, where no one likes it. I'm always interested in things that no one else likes because that can be an interesting contrarian play, but it's interesting, the stock to bond ratio very much favoring stocks once again, given the strength that we've seen uh, to end this week. 
Let's continue our Wrap the Week segment looking at the Wrap the Week chart. This is a chart looking at the weekly returns. So it's starting the clock last Friday at the close on the 20th and finishing today at the close. We'll show how all these major asset classes have evolved. Um, the labels are up in the upper left. Might be a little hard to see. So if you follow along my voice and the mouse, you can see what uh, what has done what? The S&P 500 with the strength today finishing the week higher 1.5%, which is a pretty nice upside follow through week. We've certainly seen, you know, some signs of potential weakness. We've seen weakness in individual stocks and groups, but not on the broader indexes, which continue to push higher. So what underperformed stocks this week? Three uh, of our major asset classes. Number one, bonds. The TLT was down 0.7%. Uh, this week, the U.S. dollar here in green down 0.9%. And then the worst performer of the group, Bitcoin, down 2.3%. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the chart of Bitcoin this last week, kind of trending downward overall, this is after a pretty significant rise of Bitcoin reaching back up to 49,50,000. So certainly something to watch. And you're seeing renewed strength today. Interesting to see over the weekend if that continues, given the very much risk on feel that we had on Friday's session here for uh, other assets. Everything else outperformed uh, the S&P this week. Gold is here in the uh, gold color, up 2.1%. In pink, we have the NASDAQ 100 up 2.25%. In orange, we have emerging markets up 4.2%. That's actually a really interesting one because emerging markets have consistently been at the bottom or near the bottom of the list. It's actually pretty unusual. You're seeing renewed strength in emerging markets. That's due in no small part to crude oil, which we'll get to in a minute. In purple, small caps actually up 5% in crude oil, really leading the way higher out of all these assets with the USO up 10%. 0.9%. So it's interesting the three top performers, even though stocks in the form of the S&P finished the week up about one and a half percent, the real gains were in other things. The emerging markets index up over 4%, small caps up 5%. And today was a big update for the small cap indexes. And then crude oil up uh, 10 to 11 percent. So that is all sort of the same kind of thing happening. This is representing some of the cyclicals really bouncing higher. The challenge with a lot of things like energy is they're coming off of very beaten down levels. This is a sector that's been underperforming. And even though it gained the most today, it's still lagging behind some of the other sectors. If you look at a longer period of time, uh, for sure, because it's had a, had a week, couple of months on the uh, on a relative basis. Let's finish off our Wrap the Week segment looking at the Mindful Investor Live chart list. This is a chart list that I keep maintained on Stock Charts TV. To get to this, by the way, it's not too hard. You go to the Articles tab at the top of uh, StockCharts.com. In the upper right, there's a link that says All Stock Charts Blogs, and you're going to find mine, which is called the Mindful Investor. And if you look at the top, there's a little button that says Live Chart List that will bring you to this list of charts. You're welcome to save them to your own login. Do whatever you want to them, but I'll keep that list uh, updated pretty regularly. So when we're looking at the market trend model, this is something we review every Friday. It remains fairly consistent here for quite a while. The long-term model has been bullish for over a year. The short-term model has been overall fairly bullish uh, for most of the last uh, you know, eight or nine months, really since last September and October, only a couple of weeks where it's turned negative. But for the most part, it's showing the short-term gains that you're seeing week to week or really Friday to Friday. The medium-term model is what has been much more mixed. Now, I don't have a neutral setting on this uh, on this trend model. It's it's basically binary. It's either bullish or bearish. And I did that intentionally because I, I actually run this model for my own clients on a bunch of other assets. Uh, and so I wanted it to very simply be like a, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down for a bunch of different things on three time frames just to understand the uh, the, the trend landscape. So the medium term model for me has been negative uh, since May. And what's interesting about that is if you talk about, if you think about the market environment, I would argue August, or excuse me, April into May, things really started to change. This is when a lot of individual stocks started to pull back. This is where some of the cyclical leadership, like financials and energy sort of petered out their period of outperformance, came off the FANG stocks, the mega cap tech and consumer names came up to take some of the slack, but uh, and, 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 and keep the market overall going higher. But the challenge in a lot of individual stocks, they, uh, they felt a lot of pain there. So the medium term model has been negative since May for me. That tells me to be more cautious than optimistic in terms of uh, positioning, particularly on individual uh, positions, and to think, make sure that I have a good risk assessment in uh, in place. What that's done overall is kept me in things that are working. And I think uh, when I'm looking for 
ideas or I'm looking for charts that are working. Uh, I mentioned earlier the pitch. The two sectors that were most widely represented from my three guests were two sectors, technology and consumer discretionary, by far outweighing all the other uh, all the other sectors. Uh, so clearly, there are a lot of opportunities for names that have been in strong trends, but also are continuing to push higher, rotating higher uh, through the course of this week. The daily S&P chart, again, if you know nothing else, look at a chart of the S&P. Is it making higher highs and higher lows? I would argue, of course, it is making a new all-time high again this uh, this week and uh, today with a, a first time closing above 4,500. So overall, the trend is clearly positive. So three things that I would be looking for on this chart to be less positive. And, and again, until these three things happen and these three things have not happened so far year to date, uh, then then you know there's there's no real problem with the uptrend. Number one, we would have to make a lower high, right? We would have to instead of making a higher high on the push higher, we would have to undercut that. We'd have to make a, a high below the previous high, uh, which is the first thing we need to do. The second thing is undercut the most recent swing low. So right now, if we would have some broad distribution next week, last week's lows around forty three sixty. That would be the level I would key in on as long as we remain above that. That second, uh, that second item is not checked off, but breaking below that would indicate uh, a, uh, a, a downside movement. The final one would be breaking what has served as support, which is the 50-day moving average. That has served as support for the entire year of 2021. It's been tested many times. We've closed below it just a couple times, and every single time we've gone right back above it the next day. So that at some point has to change. We have to stop making higher highs. We have to start making lower lows, and we have to break below the 50-day moving average. If and when all of those three things happen, you will hear a great change in tone from me as I get less uh you know taking the photo off the accelerator more stomping on the brake and suggesting uh that we uh that we need to think a lot more defensively until that happens it's telling you to stick with the trend let your winners run i, I think a lot of my time spent with institutional money managers taught me that in an environment like this even though you can come up with plenty of narratives and plenty of reasons why the market should stop going up as long as the chart continues higher you want to follow that trend the trend is up folks uh, by any stretch of the imagination What's interesting, and I was thinking of my, I mentioned my conversation with John Kosar on yesterday's show. It was, it was really, really interesting. He really knows uh, his stuff, does a great job of breaking down the macro environment. We were talking about his Asbury 6 model, and the one that the last indicator to turn bullish was this uh, line here, which is the advanced decline line on the uh, NYSE. So the New York Stock Exchange, much broader group than the S&P 500. You can see the S&P advanced decline line has made higher highs through the course of this year. But the advanced decline line on the NYSE actually peaked back here in June. So one of the many reasons why I've been less optimistic about further upside has been the breadth deterioration. Ind indicators like this actually not confirming uh, higher highs. You can see that I've color coded these all orange now because while I don't see them as red, I don't see them as declining anymore because they haven't undercut that low from July. The August low so far at the very least sort of even with that, it's a, sort of a double bottom so far. Now, they've stopped going down for sure. So I think they deserve to be sort of a neutral amber amber color. Uh, the one that still remains bullish is the S&P advancers decliners, which has remained fairly constructive this entire time. These other ones are more uh, neutral right now. Um, I would, you know, if we would see any distribution in stocks uh, in the indexes and think about potential downside, these 80 lines undercutting their July and August lows, I think would be a key confirmation of a rotation lower. At this point, they're holding in there just fine. Let's uh, hit on maybe another chart or two, and then we're going to have to take a quick commercial break. You know, not everything is perfectly uh, bullish. And again, I'm, you know, the market's rallied so beautifully uh, today. And and again, I'm I'm concerned about how what the Fed is uh, what Fed is doing by they have this genius move of having sort of the more hawkish governors speaking all yesterday, and then Powell comes in and he's not. He's less dovish than he was, but managed to sound a little more supportive than all the people speaking yesterday. It was beautifully crafted. I can only imagine that was a concerted effort to try to cushion the blow of the Fed taking their foot off of the gas pedal, which is what they have telegraphed that they're going to do. Um, you know, that hasn't been reflected on any sort of negativity with stocks. Stocks actually rallied today with the assumption, with the expectation, as, uh, as Powell implied, that Fed rate hikes would be further down the road. Uh, but what you are seeing is that still four out of five S&P names are above their 200-day moving average. That's fairly uh, fairly supportive. Um, but if it gets below 70%, even though that's still well over half, that tells you that things are starting to uh, to weaken a little bit. It tells you that 
um, you know, that uh, there is a, a bit of a deterioration in terms of stocks not holding their 200 day moving average. That could be a scenario where the market pushes higher or remains stable. And this uh, and this line goes lower. And, and if it remains above 70 percent, things are still pretty good. I think the indicator getting below 70 percent back here in February 2020 was one of the many indications that things are starting to deteriorate very quickly. So if you would get a pullback, that's one thing I would certainly look at. Still only 64 percent of the S&P names above their 50 day, by the way, that's not updated yet for today. Uh, but it's worth noting that it's still you know, almost four and five, it's about one in, you know, two and three that are above their 50 day, one out of three S&P names still below their 50 day. Uh, and it, it tells you that plenty of stocks still have more gains to be made to participate in the subtrend. It's not completely wholesale just yet. Bullish percent index actually remains below 70%, getting back above 70%, which could happen today into uh, next week, would certainly indicate an all clear and more of a bullish uh, positioning. We talked about sentiment yesterday, so I don't want to beat that anymore, but I will finish our wrap the week segment with this chart. This is the consumer offense versus defense ratio. One of my mentors at uh, or predecessors at Fidelity, really, Bill Doan, who ran the team in the 70s and, uh, and early 80s, uh, had a chart like this hanging in the Fidelity chart room. It was looking at consumer offense versus defense. It was a different group of indexes. We're using ETFs here, but the idea was similar. Uh, and what's interesting is on the cap weighted version of this, it's not really breaking out, it's really more sideways. But you have to remember that the XLY is really concentrated in only three stocks, about half of the weight are Home Depot, Amazon, and uh, and uh, Tesla. So on the bottom one, we have an equal weighted version, which is actually very close to breaking out and confirming a, uh, a very offense, very bullish indication on this offense versus defense ratio. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back answering your questions from the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's so good to have you join us every weekday after the close for our show. We're thrilled to be back live here at 4 p.m. Eastern. All of our episodes, previous guests, interviews, and everything are all on our YouTube channel and on StockCharts TV On Demand. A couple quick comments before we get to your questions from The Final Bar mailbag. Number one, the way you get your question into the mailbag is one of three ways. First off, email us. That's the best way to do it. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We would love to hear from you. Questions, feedback on the show, our host, our guests, but most importantly, questions that are coming up as you are analyzing your own charts. So email is the best way. We are also on Twitter at finalbarsctv. Just tag us in a comment there or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you, particularly your questions as you are trying to, uh, to manage these markets and, uh, and navigate these markets. We are here to help you along the way. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com, use your email address, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our great content. Fantastic special events like The Pitch, which is uh, coming out today, uh, and our mid-year special charting the second half. Great uh, shows like the fine of our guests, like John Kosar and many others that we had this week. So much great content to help uh, help you put the markets into proper perspective. Go to StockChartsTV.com or go to uh, your mobile devices, go to any of the app stores and search for StockChartsTV on demand. Let's continue on today's show answering your questions from the Final Bar mailbag. As a reminder, our email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We'd love to hear from you. Let's get to it. Question number one, I'm familiar with Fibonacci retracements, but what are Fibonacci extensions? Does StockCharts have that tool and how can I use it? Really, really good question. So we tend to focus and I tend to focus on Fibonacci retracements because that's what I use. Fibonacci extensions are a different way of applying the Fibonacci um, uh, proportions. I don't use them a ton in my process. I'm super familiar with them, and I definitely have used them. And and uh, and and many analysts, traders use them. And and you'll find them particularly in things like Elliott Wave um, uh, pattern uh, measurements. So uh, Leslie Jufloss on the pitch earlier today. We're using some extensions to you know anticipate where things may be headed and what levels may be uh, may be important. So the short answer is, yes, we have them to a degree. The long answer is we're actually in the process of redesigning all of our annotations on stockcharts.com to make them 
bigger and better and awesomer. And we will include some updated Fibonacci tools along with that. But I'm going to use ACP just to show you uh, an example here. And in our ACP platform, you click on the little pencil and the ruler, which are all the annotations. And if you go down here to Fibonacci retracement, they're kind of all grouped together. The way Fibonacci retracements work is you basically pick a high and a low and you click on one and click on the other and it shows you the retracements between the two. So if I would click on this low and then go up to this high price here, you can see I'm measuring, okay, this is the low point. That's the high point giving me the Fibonacci proportions, 23.6%, 38.2%, 50%. You can see in this case, uh, F5 actually rallied March 2020 to the peak in, uh, in uh, you know, sort of April, May came off, eventually retraced about 50% before rotating higher. So pretty interesting. Now, if you do it the other way, so if you actually start at the high and drag down, drag down to the low, you can see the retracement levels that are popping up above the high. So a Fibonacci extension basically says, I want to extend this framework even higher. So if this is 100%, What's 161.8%? So it's 100% of the move, and you add an additional 61.8%, and 161 and, and 61.8 all, all come from the Fibonacci relation. There, you can see based on that initial move out of the March 2020 low, we can project 61.8% further, and that's not far from where we're at now. That was actually the end of this leg going into the beginning of this year. From there, we've sort of petered out and have settled into there. There are other levels that are off the viewable area, and this is a very simplistic way of using extensions, you can do it other ways. And things that we're designing are basically taking this framework and copying it to other places, doing a lot of really cool manipulation of those extensions. But that's a very easy way to uh, initially use some of the, uh, the Fibonacci extensions right in Stock Charts ACP. Great question. And you'll hear more from us through the course of this year into next year as we really take a deep look into, uh, into the annotations engine on both Sharp Charts and our ACP platform. Next question, there seems to be a lot of talk right now about exhaustion indicators. Besides DeMarc, are there any other technical indicators that you have found useful in identifying these types of situations? Really good question. And I don't, you know, I, I can't show you the DeMarc indicator here, but, you know, I mentioned how that's, uh, that we had an exhaustion signal. I think at this point, given the strength that we saw this week, particularly today, I would say any sort of exhaustion pattern has probably been negated uh, because most of, uh, of DeMarc's work actually has uh, stops built into it. So there's a uh, trailing stop that's built into the sequential ind indicator and the combo indicator. Um, those both are most likely triggered now, given the, the strength that you saw today. I don't know for sure. I haven't looked at them today, to be honest with you, but I would imagine we're pretty close to a uh, to an indication, either based on the time or the price movement that's continued uh, continued higher. Your question, though, is what else would you look on top of that? That And, and I would I would say that most of technical analysis, I would say, fits into one of two buckets, leading indicators and lagging indicators. And I'm very much oversimplifying there intentionally, but uh, that's how I've tended to think of it. I tend to think of my toolkit as, or I think of the, the process of, uh, of market analysis as identifying trends, following those trends, and identifying when those trends may be exhausted. And so there are a set of lagging indicators that answer those first three questions. Where are the trends and how can I follow them? That's all the lagging component. But the leading component are things like support and resistance levels, right? You're approaching a key level at which you might expect to turn. I would argue that's in the leading indicator category. Uh, and also something like uh, exhaustion indicators. The DeMarc indicator would be, uh, indicators would be one of those. I would bucket RSI in that same group, and that's probably what I would tell you. Um, you know, it's again, it's a tough example because the s and continued higher, but you've seen these bearish divergences. Pretty much most of these have led to a limited pullback. This last one, you didn't get any pullback at all, really, after you saw the higher highs July into uh, early July into late July and a bearish divergence, lower peaks in the RSI there. We saw that in April, though, where you saw higher highs in price and lower peaks in RSI. So those divergences or, or simply the overbought and oversold conditions, some would argue, uh, especially on shorter term timeframes, are exhaustion signals. If I was trying to understand a short term time frame and just look for price swings, uh, for a, a swing trading methodology, I would use a short-term RSI or the Williams percent R or some indicator like that, and just for look for swift, quick overbought and oversold conditions. And I think overall that would point you in the right direction. So I would look for oscillators and things that are meant to capture when something has moved too far in one direction or the other. I often use RSI as more of a lagging indicator, more of an indication of overall trend. And that's where we talk about the ranges and the values, but it also has a lot of, uh, of importance as, a, as an exhaustion indicator. I would point you in that direction. 
Next question, would you consider FXI a double bottom here? Um, I've not looked at that today, uh, so let's take a look. FXI is the China ETF. We usually use either the FXI or the MCHI on this show. Different universes they're looking at, a little different construction, but overall fairly similar in terms of how they play off. I'm assuming you're talking about this a uh, little bit right here. We don't, would I call that a double bottom? Um, sure, I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, you know, in, again, I, I tend to not, I don't tend to use the words double bottom or double top only. For me, that's more the language of support and resistance. It's kind of the same thing. But for me, it's all about the market having memory and important price levels being uh, key. So at this point, I see sort of this 38 to 39 range as being pretty important on the FXI. That's, you know, we, we traded a little bit below that in mid, mid late July. But you know, overall, we, we closed just above 39 on that late July low. Here in August, we traded below there and, and closed, uh, you know, sort of just below 39. So sort of that 38 to 39 uh, range captures both of those lows. And I think that's a key level of support to watch. You know, the trend is still overall negative, I would argue, because we haven't eclipsed this swing high. And I think that's what I would leave you with. A double bottom really isn't confirmed, to be honest with you, until you break above that swing high. So it needs to get above 42 to complete that pattern. It's something important to remember with price patterns. A lot of times we see something starting to form a pattern and what you're actually seeing is the potential forming of a pattern. It's not confirmed until you get what's called the trigger. And on a double bottom pattern like this, the trigger would be a break above the swing high there. And so I would look for an, uh, the FXI above 42. If you do see that as a double bottom, to sort of validate that as a bottoming pattern. The very last question, then we have to wrap the show. Why do you keep describing this as the seasonally weakest part of the year for the S&P 500? I'll try to give it to you super, super quickly. So if you go to the seasonality chart, which is a great place to go, I'll bring up the SPY. This is going to bring up you know, a bunch of data. We'll go back to maybe 2010. So this is after the 2009 low. From there, we've been 10 plus years in a bull market phase. This is why I call it the seasonally weakest part of the year. Here's your uh, batting average. What percent of the time did the S&P close higher in that month? You can see this is the, th the weakest three month period out of the entire year. And these are the average returns. So besides May, August is the second worst uh, month in terms of the average returns for the last 10 years or so on the S&P 500. August and September, two of the worst months overall. Uh, and so overall, that is why I would consider it the seasonally weakest part of the year. You know, overall, though, I, I would rem remind you, those are seasonal tendencies, not seasonal facts. So the market can absolutely go higher in August, September and October. We're seeing that in, you know, so far this year, uh, so far in, uh, in the month of August. So remember, those are tendencies. I would follow the trend more than anything. We need to wrap the show, though, and go to the three and three, three charts. In three minutes, here we go. Chart number one is the S&P 400, the mid-cap index. It's not quite making new all-time highs, but it's really, really close. One of the challenges of this market in the last couple months is the S&P making higher highs, the mid-cap index not participating, the small-cap index not participating. Today, you saw smalls leading mids just below that, and then the S&P was actually lagging behind those other two, which is kind of unusual. The mid-cap index now making a higher low here in August and potentially making a new high, definitely a new swing high and, and nearing a new all-time high. I think that's an important chart to watch going into next week. Strength in small caps would be very encouraging in terms of overall market structure strength. Second one is the high-yield ETF, the HYG. We had a question about this earlier this week, I think in our last mailbag segment. Uh, but overall, this is another one rotating higher. You know, high-yield high bonds are sort of the equity-ish parts of, uh, of, of the fixed income uh, world. That, that's probably a horrible simplification. But, you know, I tend to think of it as more of a riskier part of, uh, of fixed income, which is right. So junk bonds are less uh, credit-reliable companies and, uh, and certainly more speculative, more higher risk but the potential for higher returns. Something like this breaking to new highs should be similar to stocks. In general, they tend to move together. So the HYG breaking out is certainly encouraging. Finally, gold. I mentioned on the pitch, which I'd encourage you to check out uh, this evening, uh, maybe over the weekend on demand uh, with our three guests. One of them highlighted gold, particularly Newmont Mining. And the rally in gold today certainly suggests some concerns about inflation, but it's interesting to see materials overall improving, commodities as a whole, doing well today, but the GLD breaking above trend line resistance using the June and August highs. I think that has a potential to go much further. We have to get above 172 first, though. Folks, that is our show for today and a wrap for this week on The Final Bar. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday, 5 at 4 p.m. Eastern, as we recap the key charts of the day and of the week. As a reminder, go to StockChartsTV.com. You can see all of our previous episodes, including some fantastic 
guest interviews for StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington. I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. We'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.